Welcome everyone to the first edition of AZ Bio Peers for 2024. And um, we are really excited today to have Garth Stevens from Snell and Wilmer, who's going to be informing us about the CTA. Um, that affects all of us, and it went into effect on Jan in January. So it's really important that we understand this new piece of policy and how it affects our businesses. Easy Bio Peers stands for professional education, edu engagement, and resource sharing. And um, this program is being recorded and will be available on the AZ Bio Peers site with all of the other educational programming um, so that you can reference it later this week. And with that, I would like to um, turn it over to Garth Stevens from Snell and Wilmer, who is going to let us know what we need to know about the CTA. Thanks, Garth. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Joan. Good morning, everybody. Um, so as Joan noted, I'm, I'm Garth Stevens. I'm a corporate M&A partner at Snell & Wilmer here in Phoenix. Been at the firm coming up on 24 years now. Um, the CTA, the Corporate Transparency Act, obviously is the subject for today's session. Uh, it is new, uh, like other sort of major corporate legal developments that have come along the lines in the last 20 odd years, things like Sarbanes-Oxley and all. Um, it, it's, it's large. It's overbearing and it's not fully fleshed out yet as uh, um, as the law develops. There are regulations, there's guidance to be developed. So I think we have a pretty good picture of what things look like right now. Um, I expect some things will evolve. We'll get more clarity on some things. I will do your best, do my best to answer your questions if you have any once I've done my initial talk. Uh, if, if there are things that I'm not able to answer with certainty, I'll let you know, but hopefully I, I can answer. So. Okay, so I'm just gonna minimize this over here. All right, so the Corporate Transparency Act uh, is became effective January 1, so just a few weeks ago. Uh, and it was designed to combat you know, money laundering, sanctions evasion, illegal drug trade, other illicit activities. There were complaints for a number of years that the US, the way corporate entities could be formed and set up, uh, shell companies and so on, just made it too easy to, to hide illicit business. Uh, and so this is all sort of designed to pierce that veil um, to create transparency. Uh, when I first read about this, it came out, it reminded me of when I when I was a junior associate at my first law firm and I had a very good mentor partner who was teaching and helping me with my contract drafting, which could be uh, overbearing and repetitive and probably pedantic. And he told me that, you know, you, you don't always have to use a sledgehammer to kill a gnat. And uh, this, uh, in my mind, is, to some extent, it is the federal government's effort to use a sledgehammer to kill a gnat. This is uh, expected to affect somewhere in the area of 32 million companies that are either U.S. companies or, or foreign companies registered in the U.S. Um, to capture or prevent you know, a very tiny fraction of that number of companies that would be involved with illicit trade, money laundering, et cetera. So um, it's it's. Uh, it's a pretty large and heavy-handed tool. Um, we'll, we'll see at the end of the day, years to come, what, what if any benefit it has. But it is what it is, as they say, so we're now dealing with it. Um, the What I'm going to talk about with the CTA is sort of what it, what it is, what it, who it applies to, who it may not apply to, uh, and then sort of what the requirements are and sort of how it, how it, how it could affect you. So... First thing is the, who it applies to is very broad. Uh, it's it's any domestic entity, whether that's a corporation, LLC, limited partnership, although not general partnerships, uh, any entity that's created by filing a document with a state authority. So if you file articles of incorporation or LLC, you know, a certificate of formation, whatever, that's included. Um, trusts themselves are not necessarily covered. Uh, although certain types of trusts, like a uh, certain like statutory trusts that again are filed by forming uh, filing a document with the state, are captured. The other group it applies to would be foreign entities that are registered in the U.S. So if you have a a European or a Canadian company, for instance, that rather than forming a subsidiary in the U.S., actually registers itself in the U.S. as a foreign entity you know, with a, again with a state office, that would be covered. Uh, there are twenty three categories of exemptions that 
are not covered by this. So in other words, these are companies that are either domestic entities or foreign entities registered in the US, but they fall within one of 23 different exemption categories. Um, and these include things like I've listed some of the main ones here. So tax exempt entities, and by that I mean not just nonprofits, because nonprofits in and of themselves are not exempt, but but a nonprofit that that has you know filed with the IRS to be a 501c3 charitable organization, for instance. Uh, public companies, insurance companies, banks, registered investment companies. Um, the last three we're going to spend more time on, large operating entities, inactive entities, and subsidiaries of certain exempt entities. Most of the ones on the list of 23, the reason they're on there is they're already regulated or subject to other reporting obligations, which would make it you know, unnecessary to go through the, the CTA reporting process. Um, but but you know, so, that, so if, if you're not a public company and you're not one of these you know already regulated entities, you know you're, you're looking to a smaller list of potential exemptions. So the first one and you know the, probably the most important one for for call it well it, the term is the large operating exemption, large operating entity exemption is these are real companies with real businesses that have real operations and employees. So. The company and, and all of these criteria have to be satisfied. The company employs more than 20 employees in the US, not, not 20 or more, but more than 20, and they have to be all in the US, has to have a physical office presence in the US, and it has to be have generated more than 5 million. And the term they use is gross receipts or sales. I just think of that as revenues, net of returns and allowance as reported in the prior year's federal income tax return. The reason that that latter one is important is that if you start up a new company, let's say this year, and right out of the gate, you're hitting all of these, but you haven't reported that 5 million in a previous tax return, then you're not yet a large operating entity. So you would potentially start off if you don't meet any of the other exemptions uh, as a company required to report under the CTA until the next year when you can change your status to an exempt entity. Sort of the reverse of that one is the inactive entity exemption. And, and this one's sort of important because many people are entrepreneurs, businesses, what have you. Whoops, did I, sorry. So I popped up my screen there. Um, people can still see the PowerPoint, I assume. All right. So, um, you know, you have companies that have been formed in the past that you never bothered dissolving, but they really haven't done anything for some time. So these are the criteria. And again, all six are required. The company had to have existed on or before January 1, 2020. Uh, it is not currently engaged in any active business. It has not owned directly or indirectly or is not owned directly or indirectly by any foreign person, meaning any non-U.S. person. Uh, there's been no change in any of the ownership in the past 12 months, no receipt or transmittal of more than $1,000 in the past 12 months, and it has no assets in the U.S. or abroad, including any ownership interest in any other entity. So in other words, if you have a shell company that, that is in some sort of share structure that owns equity, that's not an inactive entity. And then this is the sort of the, the, the other category that, that's sort of the important one, which is the subsidiary exemption, which basically says, if you have an entity that is controlled or wholly owned directly or indirectly by another entity that falls within another exemption, uh, then, then that entity is also exempt. Now, if you recall, I said there are 23 exemption categories and almost all of them will apply to this. In other words, the entity above that controls or owns, except for these ones, these categories 6, 18, and 23, money services, business, pooled investment, vehicle, and inactive entity. I don't know why they chose these three, but that is that is the rule right now. Um, control here is not defined, but the typical corporate definition of control uh, would be anything uh, over 50% ownership in terms of voting power or any other ability to control uh, shareholder voting or equity owner voting. That's an example of something that could potentially be further clarified by guidance, but for the time being, this is what we have. 
And again, that's that's direct or indirect uh, ownership or control. One other thing to keep in mind on the, going back to the um, large operating company exemption with the greater than 20 employees, that has to be within the company itself. It can, you cannot pool uh, employees across you know, a company and a subsidiary or a company and a sister company. Each company has to stand on its own uh, as to its own attributes as to whether or not it meets the criteria for any of these exemptions. Okay, so that's sort of the initial talk about who it applies to and, and who it does not apply to. And then we're gonna kind of go into really what this statute is all about, which is beneficial ownership reporting. Um, and I'll first start off by just talking about the timing of the reports that are required. Uh, and, and then we'll get into kind of more of the substance. So when do these beneficial ownership reports or BOIs, you'll, you'll, I'll, I'll start using the term BOI because that's really become sort of the terminology here. But when do these BOI reports have to be made? Well, actually, let me back up. Let me just say one thing for starters. These are not annual reports. This is a one-time report you file at the beginning within these required timeframes. And then after that, you file if there's a change in beneficial ownership information, uh, or you can, you can file if you achieve exempt status, and then you can pull yourself out of the reporting process for as long as that entity remains exempt. So in terms of timing, any entities formed before 2024, you've got a year to file. I think they, they you know, FinCEN uh, is uh, you know, aware of the fact that the number of companies out there, uh, this is gonna take some time to collect information and to get this stuff in. So they're giving uh, companies a year for any historic companies to, to file. And, what, and historic means any, single, any company out there, doesn't matter if it was formed three years ago or, or 30 years ago or 100 years ago, this reporting will have to be done if there's no exemption for that company. Uh, entities formed during 2024 will have 90 days from the date of formation of the entity. And then entities formed after 2024 will be 30 days. So really the, the, the standard is 30 days, but again, they're saying, hey, this is new and we're getting our system up to speed. So we'll, we'll for companies formed in 2024, we'll give you 90 days. Uh, as I mentioned a minute ago, there is a uh, if there is a change in beneficial ownership information, and again, we'll, we'll get into what that sort of entails in more detail. Uh, after a beneficial ownership report has been filed, then you've got 30 days from the date that the, the company became aware of that change or should have become aware of that change to file an updated BOI report. And some of these things could be a change of dress of the company or of a beneficial owner any change in control of the company uh, or, or any change in senior management, uh, change of interest passing to a new beneficial owner, which is what, what the CTA refers to, but really what we're talking about is, is changes in beneficial ownership uh, where there's a threshold uh, percentage that, that is reportable uh, or, or a name change of the company or uh, even of a beneficial owner. So any of that has to be filed within 30 days. This is probably gonna be the trickiest thing for companies to stay on top of. Um, the, the, I've, I've gone online, I've, I, you can play around with, with the actual report, you can, which you can report online. It's not that long. You, you can plug in the information pretty easily. Um, the, the, the two main challenges are gonna be one, collecting the information, especially if you've got multiple beneficial owners. Um, and then staying on top of changes and making sure that uh, all of your equity owners and, and, and administrative people understand that if, if any of these sort of triggering changes occur, they need to get reported to somebody in the company who's responsible for getting this, these BOI reports uh, filed on a timely basis. And one thing on that, by the way, as a little practice note, for those of you that uh, enter into new shareholder agreements or LLC agreements from time to time. One of the things you know we're recommending is you should have a provision in those agreements that says to all of the members, you agree that if you have any change uh, in your affairs that would result in a requirement for, for BOI reporting or BOI updating, that, that you, the member, have to timely update the company 
so that the company can timely report that. So there's three categories of information that, that is disclosed in a BOI report. The first one, which is the easiest one, is just the company information. So that's the name, including any DBA name the company go, operates under, the, its domicile, whatever the current state of its formation is, its physical address, and its tax ID number, so it's EIN. The next category is the applicant. This one's a little ambiguous still, but it's, it's basically one or two people, not more than two people, these are the people that were responsible for filing the documents that formed the company. Uh, now, the good news is that you only have to fill in applicant information for companies that are formed in or after 2024. So you don't have to worry about a company that you have that was formed 15 years ago and you can't remember who, who filed it. And so how are you gonna know who the applicant was? If this is strictly, this one category is strictly for companies formed in 2024 or after. So And so there, there's sort of two categories of who is an applicant. One is the person that directly, emphasis on directly, submits the uh, filing document with the state authority to form the company. So that is anybody from you know, the company employee who does that, uh, the company attorney or paralegal, uh, or if you use a you know, filing service like CT Corp or Paracorp or something like that, it will be the person at Paracorp or CT who, who directly submits that to the state. The other person is the person who was directly responsible for overseeing or causing the, those documents to be uh, prepared and filed. So that would be you know, either uh, a, a company employee, could be in-house counsel or a GC or just somebody else that's overseeing that, or again, it could be an outside attorney. Uh, that this is one that I will say, is, as, as speaking as a lawyer at a law firm, that we're still trying to get our hands around, uh, just because obviously we 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 don't want to be uh, leaving companies hanging, giving them the wrong information as to who the applicant is, whether that is, for instance, an attorney or whether it's uh, uh, should be somebody from the company. And then the last category, which is the most important one, are beneficial owners. Uh, and these are individuals who directly or indirectly, and again, emphasis on directly or indirectly, because this could go far up a chain, depend, you know, potentially, through any contract, arrangement, understanding, relationship, or otherwise, either exercises substantial control over the entity, and we'll get into what substantial control means, or owns at least 25% of the ownership interests of the entity. And we're going to talk about ownership interests, because typically when we think of control in the corporate setting, we're talking about voting power, and we're talking about stock. It's much broader here, which is potentially challenging, but also potentially good in terms of what that may limit in terms of reporting. So what must be disclosed for the applicant or the beneficial owner? Their name, date of birth, address, either residential or business address, if, if it's a company business, or I should say it's the company's business address. They're a, a government ID number, which can be a passport or a driver's license, for instance, and there has to be an uploaded photo of that ID. Now, that's going to make potentially some people cringe, uh, the idea that they've got to have this stuff online and up there. Uh, one thing I should have mentioned is that the information that's disclosed through BOI reports is not publicly available. Uh, it is open to federal and state and tribal law enforcement. Uh, it's open to financial institutions with the consent of the reporting company. Uh, so this is not something that if you've got your photo ID out there that anybody can just grab. Now, of course, you've got risks of hacks and things like that, but it, for the most part, it is in a government secure database. Um, now, one thing that can be done to expedite beneficial or applicant information is you can apply online, and I did it myself, uh, since I, my guess is I'm gonna end up being an applicant in a number of cases, uh, to obtain a FinCEN ID number. And, it, and it's very easy to do. It took me, I don't know, two, three minutes. The longest time was just taking a picture of my driver's license and uploading it. That can be used in the BOI report in lieu of having to fill in a bunch of other information on the person or uploading their, their photo ID. So if you have a 
you know, a company employee and you're regularly forming companies, you don't want to have to keep asking them for a copy of their ID and this information. If they've obtained a FinCEN number you can, and you have that, you can just plug that in because their information will then already be online with, with FinCEN. Actually, so let's talk a bit about substantial control as that definition is. It's a broad group. So what they refer to as indicators, it can include you know, all the sort of C-suite top level executives or any other officer performing similar functions. LLCs often don't have officers or they'll have managers um, or managing members. So uh, if you have people in those capacities, uh, they would be here. Uh, any individual with the ability to appoint or remove any senior officer or a majority of the board or similar body. Any important decision maker, so determines, directs, or has substantial influence over important decisions of the company, including those related to business, finances, or, or entity structure, or any other form of substantial control. And again, keep in mind, this is direct or indirect. So if you're You've structured an LLC so that the manager is a, is a corporate entity or another LLC. You've, you've got to kind of go up through the chain. Who ultimately is the individual who is calling the shots? We're not going to be able to hide behind entities for any of this reporting. So ownership interests, as you can see here, is very broad. So there's the obvious things like stock or LLC interests or LP interests, um, whether or not voting, which is... Interesting, but when you think about it, I mean, if, you know, what they really want to find out is who is behind these structures, who's got economic rights, even if they don't have control. So uh, any type of equity ownership interest, certificates of interest in a business trust, a capital or profits interest in an LLC or LP, any convertible instruments, that includes debt, so convertible notes or convertible debentures, or warrants or rights to purchase, options, puts, calls, or any other contract or arrangement that, that is used to establish some form of ownership or, or, or quasi-ownership. So I said a minute ago, this is both sort of challenging and potentially good. The reason it's challenging is that's a, that's a lot of stuff to consider. Now, if you're a relatively small company with a relatively simple capital structure, that's not that difficult. And, and if your investors going up the chain are mostly just individuals, or maybe there's an LLC or two and you, you can track through those, that's not that complicated. But if you are moving up the chain and you've got, for instance, private equity investors, hedge fund or something like that, where that can get pretty oblique as to who's up there, you know, that's going to make this a real headache to have to figure out what all of the ownership interests are, are involved. And so that, that's the challenging side. The good side is right now, the, it just says 25% of ownership interests. It doesn't say, for instance, 25% of any class of ownership interests. So somebody might own 30% of the stock of a company, but if you factor in all of the warrants and options and, and everything else that's out there, it, maybe they, and, and again, that, that, that's a tricky calculation uh, since they haven't provided any guidance on that, uh, their 30% may really only be 10%, which means they wouldn't be a beneficial owner. This one is one that I'm still working my head through. It's one that I'm, you know, if a client calls and gives me some complicated structure and says, you know, does so-and-so have 25% ownership? I'm going to have to spend some real time on that one because um, th this could get tricky. The advice I would give right now is I would probably, if, if you're on the, in the gray area, if you're on the cusp, I would err on the side of, of over disclosure, you're not going to get in trouble for disclosing something. Um, there could be trouble for, for not disclosing when you should have, although but we'll talk about that a little more. And 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 well, th this this is it. So um, there are criminal and civil penalties. Now, this is for willfully providing false or fraudulent BOI in a report, uh, or willfully failing to make a new or updated BOI report. So. You know, it's if if it slips somebody's mind, they forgot to file a report, and 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 you know, FinCEN ever comes knocking on the door saying you had this change of beneficial ownership we learned about, you never filed an update report, and you could prove that it was just a you know a negligent or careless error. You know, maybe you win that day because it wasn't willful, um, but 
do you really want to be in a situation where you're going to have to do that? So the penalties are up to $500 per day for each day the violation continues with no limit on that and a fine of up to $10,000 for two years in jail or both. So those are pretty serious consequences. Again, that's willful, um, but I, I'd hate to have anybody in a position where they have to be defending themselves to whether something was willful or not. There is a safe harbor uh, that if a person, uh, you know, believes that, that, that a report or learns or, you know, contained inaccurate information and they file a correction within 90 days after the original report is filed, they're off the hook. Um, but they cannot know, have known about the inaccuracy at the time of filing. Uh, and, uh, and they can't have, you know, the original filing can't have been done for the purpose of evading BOI reporting at that time. So there are, there, I will give credit <laughs> to the, to the federal government on this one, they, they have put together some very useful online resources. Uh, the, uh, the FinCEN, the main reporting website is the first one here with this link. Uh, and that, that through that website, you can also obtain a, a, a FinCEN ID if you want to get one. The FAQ page and then this small entity compliance guide, both very handy. The FAQ page will provide a lot of information and then with, with many of the answers on there, they will refer you to a particular section of the small entity compliance guide. Each document, you know, you, you, they're online, but you can print them off as maybe, I don't know, 20 odd pages. So they're not hugely bulky. They're, they're quite easy to navigate uh, and they can provide a lot of information. So I'm just gonna check the questions here on the chat since that's the main substance. Um, are sole proprietor LLCs that are passed through entities exempt? Yes. Now I will, one point is to note is that a sole proprietor, him or herself, just an individual is not a reporting entity, but yes, sole LLCs are companies so that they are reporting companies. Uh, from Doug Klein, how do you treat a 25% or greater than 25% controlling shareholder that is a fund such as a VC, put another way, the company isn't exempt from filing, but as an owner that isn't directly a person. The answer, and this is the headache, is you're going to have to look through that VC and that VC is going to have to go up and look at its investors and, and so on. Uh, so if you if you recall that the 25% is anybody who directly or indirectly, and, and anybody I should clarify is any individual. So for those of you that have uh, entity investors, be they VCs or private equity firms or just anybody else that's invested through any kind of a company or a trust, you're going to have to be reaching out to them to obtain this information. This, this will be the biggest headache in, in dealing with, with BOI reporting. The, as I said, the, the reporting uh, online, once you have compiled the information, isn't that difficult. Now, of course, if you've got to report BOI for many, many, many parties, that's going to take a bit of time to, to upload, but the online form itself is, is, is pretty simple to navigate. Is the administrator, in parens, not the manager, of a member-managed LLC considered to have substantial control? The administrator performs operational processes, bookkeeping, tax returns, but cannot make business decisions. Uh, from the way that's described, I would probably say no, because a person that's merely an administrator, they're carrying out administrative functions at the direction of somebody who does, that is a substantial controlling person. I, I would say probably not, it, it, again, in those circumstances described, uh, but it is gonna be a facts and circumstances test. The other thing I would point out, by the way, is that for LLCs or LPs, where we have these, you know, what's referred to as a tax matters partner, uh, the person that's typically uh, anointed is the person that's sort of charged with interfacing with the IRS or any tax authority. That party in that capacity alone does not make them uh, a, uh, a substantially controlling person. Now, if that person is also a manager of the LLC or something like that, they could be, but merely being a tax matters partner uh, does not. And by the way, you know the, the administrator here, if that administrator uh, was the person that dealt with the formation of, of the LLC, 
uh, even if they're not therefore a beneficial owner, they could be an applicant. So that's just something to keep in mind. Do you have to report at least one beneficial owner, even if there is none falling under the definitions? You know, it's an interesting question. Um, I, I don't see a scenario where there isn't at least one, because even if you don't have any beneficial owners based on the 25% threshold, there has to be at least somebody who's making controlling or operational decisions regarding the company. Uh, and for that reason, that person would be a substantial control person, and that would be reportable. So there's a question uh, from, uh, from Kevin Engelhold. Investment companies appear to be exempt from this correct question mark. Uh, I believe pooled investment vehicles is one category. Um, I, I I think the answer is correct is sort of, but but you need to look at the details and you need to look at the guidance. If you go to the small entity compliance guide for each category of exemption, it will give you a, a more detailed write-up as to what the criteria is. So, so Kevin, I'd have you uh, uh, look at that. Uh, to get a, a more clear answer. I don't want to give you incomplete or inaccurate information. Uh, from Kate Miller, any thought on series LLCs? I haven't looked at this specifically in the context of series LLCs, uh, but uh, again, it applies to all entities. So each entity stands on its own as to its own criteria. I think your best bet maybe with series LLCs is if they are subsidiaries of an exempt entity, then they would be exempt as long as that upstream exempt entity is also exempt. So, Garth, just to qualify on that, so if I'm under the five million dollar threshold, so I'm small, mm -hmm. um, but my investors are above the five million dollar threshold, they're large, then I just have to say that they're an investor and they're exempt. Well, the five million dollar threshold goes to whether or not you qualify for the large operating entity exemption. So, if you don't, and there's no other exemption, then you are a reporting company, and then you have to report the beneficial ownership information. But I only have to report. But for instance, so let's say that, and this is a hypothetical. So. I'm I am a small company. I do not meet the large company threshold. Mm -hmm. But my investor is one of the top 10 VCs. They do pass the large company threshold. So, so do I simply say that they are an investor, but I don't have to report their data because they don't have to no. report? No, the, the the large company only goes to whether or not you're exempt from reporting. If you're not exempt from reporting, you have to report the beneficial ownership information. Now, if your investor is exempt, either by virtue of being a large operating company or, or in some other exemption category, and uh, you are wholly owned or controlled, and again, as a reminder, what I said earlier, controlled isn't yet clearly defined, but if you are wholly owned or controlled by that investor, then you should meet the subsidiary exemption. And that in that case, you don't have to do any BOI reporting. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, there was a comment about the 23 exemptions, but vague. There's a link here to a Arizona Corporation Commission document. I, I, I don't think I've looked at that one. I would again refer you to the, to the, the FinCEN Small Entity Compliance Guide. I think you'll find more clarification there. Um, that was it at least so far for the chat comments. I will, you know, you're dealing with a lawyer, so you can't have a lawyer without a disclaimer. Just kind of point out that <laughs> this presentation and everything I'm sort of answering in response to questions is for informational purposes only. Uh, unless there's anybody on this call, I think there's one, uh, Doug Klein, where our firm is already legal counsel. We're not acting as legal counsel here, so please do consult with your own legal counsel. Uh, not strictly to get me off the hook or anything, but just because this is important stuff and it's going to take a little while to get our hands around it. I think once you do have uh, your hands around it, you'll find the process isn't that difficult, again, at least for the uploading, but it's gonna be collecting the BOI information and, and staying on top of any changes. So I'll, I'm happy still to answer any questions, but I'm also mindful of people's time. Okay, great. Garth, thank you so much, and you can unshare your screen. Sure, there's one more question. Oh, that's just, yeah. 
Okay. So thank you everyone um, for joining us today and we will get this up and uh, posted and let you know when the video is available if you want to review it. Um, but again, a big thank you um, to Garth and the team at Snell and Wilmer for putting this together and getting us this very important update. And um, as things evolve, uh, we'll be keeping you in the loop. Um, join us next month where we're going to be talking about boards of directors, uh, which is a different kind of controlling entity and one that is very, very important um, to the growth and management of our companies. Thanks for joining us for AZ Bio Peers. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, all. Bye-bye.